I mean, you're living in your mother's basement writing a blog on finance. Really, you should stay off the computer, son, and get a job. Seriously. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and is there a stranger in your house? There might be if you're one of the millions of people making short-term rentals out of their home to stack a few more Benjamins. It might even be time for me to hop on that train. Today, to show us how it works, we welcome the author of Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth, Avery Carl. In headlines, yet another scammer at work, this time at your car dealer? We'll share an elaborate one today. Then, we'll throw out the Haven Lifeline to Amanda, who hit a huge milestone. And I'll also check in with my trivia. And now, two guys who will serve as your hosts in House of Benjamins, Joe and O. They say money doesn't grow on trees, but imagine if your house had Benjamin walls. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money. I am super happy to welcome you to Hump Day and also to guide you into the second half of the week. We're all rolling toward the weekend as of right now. And the dude who's leading this charge toward the weekend, because he's ready for it today, it's Mr. OG. How are you, man? On the road again. Can't wait to be on the road again. Absolutely. I am actually not in the basement. I'm sitting across the virtual card table from you. I am in Orlando as we record this. When you hear it, I will be in Atlanta. So Atlanta, OG and I coming to see you uh, today. Come see us uh, at Monkey Wrench Brewing, stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked. Next week, Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, and Norfolk, Virginia Beach. So find out more, stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked. Ready to make people some Benjamins today, dude? Is there a day we don't make people Benjamins? Hell no, there's not. Let's bring the wood. Isn't that bring the lumber? (laughs) Be the same thing, right? It, It is. It is the same thing. Just a little, little <sighs> awkward. Get your minds out of the gutter, both of you. Uh, we got Avery Carl here today. You know, Avery Carl, if you think that you don't have enough money to get on the road, OG, and get started, making $36,000 at age 26, bought her first rental property. Now she is a short-term rental queen. She teaches other people how to do it. I think the number of houses she owns is a bajillion. I think that's the that's the number. Might be rounding Scientific. a little. Yes. Scientific number. Yeah. But she has a ton. She's going to teach people, you know, we've talked about long-term buy and hold real estate, but what about getting into the Airbnb game? We're going to talk about doing that today with Avery, but first, well, in 2007, two roommates rented out an air mattress to strangers to earn some extra money. And that little experiment turned into Airbnb and exploded into a worldwide phenomenon with rentals in over 100,000 cities. But one of those cities didn't want anything to do with the startup, New York. Business Wars is a podcast from Wondery that examines the world's biggest company rivalries and how the outcomes of these battles shape what we buy and how we live. In the new season, Airbnb versus New York City, hear how the battle with the city became a symbol of the struggle between startups and regulators. As Airbnb host realized how lucrative the side hustle could be, it quickly expanded to include entire apartments, luxury units, and even castles. Soon, real estate speculators were snapping up properties left and right to rent out on Airbnb. But rather than make money for regular people as it promised, Airbnb began to limit New York's already short supply of affordable housing. Angry renters complained so much that New York City officials decided to do something about it but Airbnb wasn't going down without a fight. You know, it's amazing. We talk a lot here about uh, making money on real estate and Airbnb and short-term rentals, something that we are exploring uh, with friends here locally. It's super interesting. All of these wars that Airbnb has in different cities, but the one in New York, even more epic. And that's why you should listen. So listen to Business Wars on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Our priorities, they've changed. It's not just about getting ahead 
or the constant grind. It's about knowing what you want and focusing on what matters. That's the kind of thinking that went into the completely redesigned 2022 Lexus NX. More than an available 14-inch touchscreen, we gave it an all-new intuitive interface designed to minimize distractions and frustrations. More than an impressive safety system, it is the most advanced standard active safety system ever offered in the Lexus, designed to not only help protect you and your passengers, but others on the road. More than offering gas, turbo, and hybrid options, it's also available as a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. More than a well-designed driver-centric cockpit, it's available with a range of features that any driver can appreciate, like a panorama glass roof, thematic ambient illumination, and a new virtual assistant that can be summoned by simply uttering the phrase, Hey Lexus. To see the new NX and to discover everything it was designed to do for you, visit Lexus.com slash NX, the all-new 2022 Lexus NX. Welcome to the next level. PHEV model available in states, excluding Vermont, that have adopted zero emissions vehicle regulations. Avery Carl, waiting upstairs. But even before that, let's get you a headline. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Today's headline comes to us from Jalopnik, which is a website uh, all about car culture. This is written by Lawrence Hodge. Car salesman in Michigan, OG, back in our old stomping grounds, was just caught in one of the most elaborate scams you'll probably ever see. You did see this uh, headline earlier. I did. Over 30 people defrauded on this one. Lawrence writes, a good car salesman without a job can be a dangerous person. All that industry know-how under their belt can create the perfect storm for fraud if one wanted to go down that road of finessing people out of their money. That's what happened with one finessing. I like how do you use an, a nice adjective? <laughs> is is that taught in like journalism school where it's like, you know, mm-hmm. you have a little play on words there, you use finesse to, to mean screwed. I like right? the word screwed. But I like the word finessing much better than uh I mean it's it's a little creative compared to every time the stock market does anything, OG, we get either soar or plummet, right? Yeah, but the juxtapose conversation there just uh why didn't you just say like hoodwinked? Yes. You appreciate the dichotomy. Is that what you're saying? I don't actually. I find it unnerving. Ah, That's what I <laughs> feel like you're being hoodwinked as a reader. Yes. Yes. Interesting. Well, I don't the know. Fragility is... of, of OG. I don't think the author tent here was to hoodwink people because he's going to he's gonna do a good job at telling you about how people got screwed. Yeah. But maybe he should have laid it on the line. Uh, as we were talking before we hit record, this is not a new scam, but I think what's interesting about this one was that the scammer was able to finesse people out of their money because of the unique COVID environment. Right? Yes. That, that was what allowed him, I think, to go so far was because he was able to say, ah, oh, we can't meet at the dealership because we don't want to, we can't be close to each other. Let's meet in a parking lot. So I think that's what maybe makes this a new twist on an old game. And to give people an idea of what Doug's talking about, Ricardo Perez, who is the person who concocted this scam, he had been a salesperson at Dick Scott, Jeep, Ram, Dodge, Chrysler. Man, that's a lot of different uh, car companies all in one. At Dick Scott, Jeep, Ram, Dodge, Chrysler, BMW, Mercedes. Dick's got all of those? Ford. I (laughs) I don't know. He had been fired in 2021 for fraud and theft, but rather, and this is what the author said, I I did like this, rather than try to find a position at another dealership, he decided to take his dealer contacts and continue grifting by creating an elaborate web of a scam. So like Doug said, he'd meet people in the parking lot saying, oh, you know, because of COVID, we need distancing rules. And then he would do something called a lease pull ahead. We talk about how leasing a car, OG, not always in your favor, not a great thing, unless you just always want to have a new car, which for some people, maybe for work, they need a new car. But this idea of a lease pull ahead, what's that all about? Usually you have a timeline associated with your lease, three years and so many miles or something like that. But as you get closer to the end of the lease, car manufacturers will generally have some sort of deal to get you to buy the new one sooner than waiting. And so they'll say, hey, if you've got less than six months on your lease, why don't you bring it in now and we'll forgive a payment or two or three or five if you get a new one. And so it just kind of keeps the gravy train going. 
What's funny when you talk about uh, them forgiving payments, he told people, oh, gee, they wouldn't have to pay their next three payments. It's a good deal. And he would go inside the dealership himself and he would sign them up for debt, actually sign their name. He'd take all their paperwork, take it inside, sign them up for debt. And then he wouldn't, he wouldn't turn the car in. He would actually sell the car then to somebody else. So he screws their credit. He takes their money. He takes the car, sells the car to somebody else. It's pretty good work if you can get it. Yeah. Yeah. I always wonder about these folks who start these little, you know, scams for for lack of a better term. Like, what's the out? You know, like when you start a McDonald's or a Panera franchise, you're like, okay, I hope to make enough money that I can retire one day. Like, what's the out for scamming people out of money? (laughs) Like, Well, and that's funny you say that because I was thinking when he, when he said people's first three payments were, were forgiven, that only gives them a three month window, like three months from now, somebody's on to you. Right. Exactly. I guess maybe criminals aren't as smart as we give them credit for, I suppose. But I will tell you this, this one's difficult. Like I could see myself getting caught in the scam. Sometimes we have scam stuff that's on here that I don't know that I would get caught in. This one during COVID, okay, we can't go inside. You have to meet me in the parking lot. He's worked the dealership before. He's meeting you in the dealership parking lot where he used to work. So not sure, not sure how I would have, uh, would have known that I was getting scammed in this deal. When I leased a car last year and turned it in, they were closed for whatever reason on the day that I turned the lease in, maybe it's Sunday or something. But anyways, I like literally videotaped myself parking the car directly in front of the the bay doors. Just to show them. Right in the way, just so that there was no... You know, like videotape myself getting out of the car, locking it with the keys. I got both keys walking, like maintaining continuous video, yeah. you know, of the of of the keys in my hand to put them into the drop box. And I went, there's your car. Those are your keys. See you later. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> and, that's pretty uh, smart. It reminds me of a time and this is before we all had video recording devices and photo devices in our in our pockets. But I turned in a, a lease car then like three months later got a really big bill for a bunch of damage they claimed was on the car that was definitely not there and uh i don't know if i would have thought of it if i had a cell phone in my pocket at the time but pretty good idea to do a once around the car yeah i did that when you turn it in to avoid another scam yeah you should do that when you rent a car too absolutely your car rental that's right totally should how many times have we seen a car rental agency tell you that you had some, some problem with your car and you didn't, there was only one time I turned a car in and there was this huge black mark down the bumper and the guy comes up and he's like, uh, uh, you hit something. And I looked at it and looked like, hello, gee, like I had hit something. I have no idea what it was, but he, probably a small child, <laughs> but hopefully not. No, nope. hopefully, no. hopefully no. not. He walks around to get the mileage and I, and I lick my finger and I just start trying to rub the thing, hoping like I'll, because he had made it clear that that was going to be a problem. And luckily it ended up just being some pain or some. It buffed right out. It did. It buffed right out. It was incredible. So next time you hit somebody or hit something, just take your finger, rub your car a little bit. No, this is so wrong. Why are we t- I thought you were going to give me like a Seinfeld story of like, do you need the insurance? Oh yeah, I need the insurance. Oh yes, I'm going to need lots of insurance. How Just ask OG and neighbor Doug what kind of driver I am. Can we double that insurance? My uh, my roommate in college, after he got out of college, when he would when he would get a rental car. He would just abuse it. Just yeah, not what was not kind to his rental cars at all on purpose. He's like, I want to see how fast it would go. I just wanted to see. It's not my car. I don't know. I think they can track that now, though. Man, I hope so because uh, those little snapshot things in your in your yeah. car, and they're like, you know, hey, why are you going uh, 120 in a in a Ford Fusion? Yeah, in Tijuana. <laughs> When this is not supposed to be outside of Michigan, Indiana, (laughs) or Ohio. (laughs) How do you end up in Tijuana? Uh, Another swindle that people have been talking about lately, much more than this one. Have you seen this Tinder swindler guy on Netflix? No? Doug, you're smiling. Not allowed on Tinder. No, I actually thought that's a great phrase to coin. 
I think you need to be a twin. What did you say? Twindle? Twinder? Tinder. Twindle, Tinder. Tinder swindler. Swindler. Just mash that up and there's a whole new industry you just created. Yeah. Well, sadly, Netflix created that industry before we did. They got there slightly ahead of Damn us. It. But this is a guy who says that he's a big businessman, that he's done all kinds of things, and he's done nothing except defraud people out of money. And and he gets people to buy him trips on private planes and talk about doubling down. The dude in the Jalopnik story with the car dealership doubles down by actually not turning in the cars and by signing these people up for debt, right? This guy doubles down because after he goes on Netflix, he said that the Netflix documentary was in fact, quote, about his successful business career. When, when people ask him what it's about, he's like, it's a success. I'm very successful. And he is OG. He's incredibly yeah. successful. He's not saying he's legal. He's just saying he's successful. I might have to watch it. Although, like <laughs> all those stories, remember that uh, fire, the, the fire party, whatever it was called? Fire, the fire Festival, Island. yeah. Yeah. Yes. Fire Festival. Like, I, I couldn't stand watching that stuff. No. Like, I don't. The documentary about it? Yeah. yeah it makes my skin crawl. It was painful all the way around. We will link to these in our show notes page. What's our takeaway here, though, OG? I mean, the swindlers are out. Yeah. Beware there are bad people in the world. There are bad people. Watch out. Headline. I just read an article that said, um, you know, with all the stuff going on in Russia and the Eastern Europe, like all of the technology stuff is increasing, right? Like all the technology swindling, hacking and that sort of stuff is 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 on its way up. So to be pay attention to that, I think, you know, ultimately you just have to verify that everything that you're doing is being done the way that you think, you know? You've long since advocated, Joe, doing the weekly money meeting. And, you know, you're not going to catch everything. You're not going to know when somebody ganks your credit card at the restaurant. It's just sometimes it happens and, you know, you hope that Amex catches it or you catch it. But if you don't if you don't see it for six months, you know, and it's not until you have the 10 credit cards open in your name because you don't look at your credit report every so often. Yeah. Then it's really hard to unwind. And you know, this one with the car would be especially difficult, like you mentioned, because I'm meeting the guy who used to work at the dealership who sold me the car three years ago at the dealership. Yeah. But again, you might see it if it's on your credit report. You should know what you're supposed to get out of that transaction, you know, a, a, a payoff agreement, you also, that sort of thing. Right. More specifically on this, though, I mean, in the history of, at least in modern times, very few legit transactions happen out in parking lots, like in random parking lots, it, it, unless you really want a bitchin' pair of speakers out of the yeah, back but, of some okay. guy's trunk. But, <laughs> so this guy wasn't doing, I, if the way I read the article, I don't think he was doing these transactions in the car dealership's parking lot. He was meeting at different parking lots. So it, you're right, OG. It was the guy that sold me the car three years ago, and I kind of know him and kind of trust him a little bit. But that's one very specific thing you can keep your antenna up for is why are we meeting at the well, Walmart parking lot? Well, but still, in this case, the COVID thing, I think the COVID thing said a lot there. Yeah. Yeah. But your spidey senses should go up. That something doesn't feel right. Why aren't we meeting in the dealership where you work? Because I don't think he was, if I remember the article correctly. We'll dive even further into this in their 201. The show is the 101. If you would like more tips on how to avoid scammers and uh, if you'd like more tips on how to avoid whatever scam is going down, Brooke Miller, former financial planner herself, has a bunch more for you. StackingBenjamins.com slash 201. Uh, always free and uh, really, really good newsletter that we're proud of. Coming up next, Avery Carl is somebody who at 26 years old bought her first investment on a $37,000 salary. She turned that very quickly into 30 doors and now has scaled that even more. She is also now a top 1% real estate agent and CEO, co-founder of the Short Term Shop, teaching people the best ways. But you know what? We got her here today, OG. So we're going to ask her exactly how this whole Airbnb VRBO thing works. But first, Doug. Hey there, Staggers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I think I'm ready to make a B&B &B out of the basement. 
I can even get Joe's mom on board. She makes this incredible brothy soup and we can just have it on tap. Yeah. Or like a broth fountain with a fixin's buffet. That'll be our hook. Let me see. Uh, gonna need a name. Something that plays on hotel that gets the broth in there too. Uh, like maybe bee and broth or uh, oh, uh, ho broth. No, no, no. Here we go. Here we go. Broth and L from the L from Hotel Broth L. I'm getting in on a big trend here. How big? That's my trivia. How many guest stays has Airbnb brokered? Is it more than 1 million, more than 100 million, or a billion? I'll be back with the answer after I get Joe's mom to start on the soup. Well, managing your money can be stressful because of all the work you need to do. I know it's stressful for me right now because I'm going from city to city. Not sure where I'm going to be on uh, any given day. All the stuff that comes with traveling, all the unexpected. Uh, oh, yeah, I forgot that. Oh, uh, travel took longer than I thought it was going to. That trip got canceled. Fantastic. You know, but even without that money can be stressful, but Navy Federal Credit Union can take a lot of that legwork out of saving and investing. They offer multiple savings products and investing options to help you get closer to your financial goals. And you can put your money to work by automating your savings and investments. Plus, they offer educational resources to help guide your decisions. Learn more at NavyFederal.org slash save and invest. That's NavyFederal.org slash save and invest. Savings products insured by NCUA. Investment options are available through Navy Federal Investment Services and are not insured by NCUA. The American workplace was changing even before the pandemic. Now those changes have been thrown into stark relief, along with our notions of where work fits into our lives. I'm Tess Vigland, host of The Wall Street Journal's new podcast, As We Work, the show about work relationships, money, ambition, and more. And I hope you'll join us for this conversation. That's As We Work from The Wall Street Journal. Hey there, stackers. I'm Tex Arcana, experience procurer and professional slumber party host, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. Airbnb started in 2007 with the kind of slumber party you pay for, if you know what I mean. It's since spread to more than 6 million hosts who make an average of $9,000 a year. So how many guest arrivals have been organized through the platform? One billion. And now, with my new brothel concept, it's a billion and one. And now to teach you how you might become someone who welcomes this cash flow, Avery Carl. And on my dad's shortwave radio, it's my new friend, Avery Carl. Avery, how are you? I'm doing fine. Thanks so much for having me. Well, I'm so happy to finally talk to you. And I really like this topic and I didn't know how to approach it. And I don't believe a lot of people in the area of real estate. And then our mutual friend, Mindy Jensen said, you have to talk to Avery Carl. And if Mindy says you're awesome, then I went and I did my own homework like everybody should. And you are awesome. But I think the way we oh, <laughs> introduce how awesome you are, let's, let's talk about your background a little bit. Tell me about you and your family's relationship relationship growing up to Destin, Florida, because that that really is the start of your story, I think. Yeah, it is. So uh, I grew up in Mississippi. And if you live in the Southeast and even the Midwest, the place you go on vacation to the beach is Destin, Florida or 30A, that little area. I'm and in, we went I'm in Texarkana, by the way, Avery. I'm in Texarkana oh, okay. and everybody here goes to Destin, Florida. And it's funny because I'm from Detroit, so I didn't know anything about it. And then a couple years ago, we went to Grayton Beach for the first time, which is right there. Just amazing. Just amazing. Mm -hmm. I live about 10 minutes from Grayton. It's awesome. Show off. Uh, and that's actually where we used to go. So sometimes we would go to Destin. Uh, but for a, about a five-year stint there, we went to Grayton Beach every year. And I remember when I got old enough to like realize what real estate was and what owning a house was. I think I was probably in like, I was probably maybe 10 and I thought, man, I want to have one of these houses one day. What do these people do for a living that they can just own these houses? And I was trying to figure out, what do I do for a living to own those houses? And then it turns out I own those houses for a living. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but the goal was always, I want one of those great houses. And I still don't have a great house. They're way too expensive, but I have stuff 
around it. <laughs> well, and so it, and it that's seems, where it started. Well, and it seems like also, and, and you tell me this, it seems like it's safer, especially for people starting out with what you do to start with less expensive properties than Grayton Beach will be. Because for people who don't know Grayton Beach, these are some, I mean, these are bajillion dollar houses, I think is the technical term. Yeah, pretty scientific. Is it safer to start a little downstream of that though, if you're beginning with your first house? Absolutely. So my first short-term rental was $150,000 and you absolutely do not have to go spend a bajillion dollars to make money. As a matter of fact, you can have a lower return on investment on a bajillion dollar beachfront house Mm. than a house like three or four blocks back that's still walkable, but is, you know, a quarter of the price. Yeah. Uh, Back to your story. You started doing short term rentals while living in New York City. And by the way, nothing makes me think of how do I make money off this more than (laughs) renting in New York City? (laughs) Because it seems like you lived in what an apartment with three people and and, uh, one of your roommates was doing something really cool. Yeah, yeah. So we were all musicians. We would go on tour at different times. And one of my roommate's boyfriend, his name was Ian, who is now he owns several short term rentals the right way that we helped him buy now. But uh, back then it was before there were a lot of regulations. Airbnb was still pretty new. And every time he went on tour, he would Airbnb his room in the apartment, which I thought he was a total trash bag for doing that. I was like, man, he's just getting around like having to have a job. What's he going to do in 10 years when he needs to work? And he he had four or five different apartments that he rented and then subleased on Airbnb. It's called rental arbitrage. Now it was before, this was back before that was a thing. I totally thought he was scummy. Well, he even, <laughs> and, well, well, and talk about something that not only did you think was scummy, but even when I read it now, I mean, they went so far as to what? There was like a futon in the kitchen. They were renting out to people at one point. Yeah. So they built a wall in their living room and turned it into another bedroom. So they were, they were short term running that bedroom. And then there was just a couch in the kitchen that people (laughs) would rent. And there was one time I went over there and it was like a, a young girl, like a 20 year old girl. And I was thinking, what are you doing? Just renting, renting couches in people's kitchens. What are you thinking? But, uh, they made money and they made friends doing that. And here, you know, they're doing great today. He's now like, I think he's an electrical engineer and he owns probably 10 short-term rentals on the side. So wow. he's doing pretty good. <laughs> well, yeah, I like the friendship piece of that. But also you said, you know, I mean, these people are musicians are probably struggling some, and you said it brought the rent down quite a bit. And for people that are adventurous, you know, people that backpack through Europe or like hostels, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, having a futon in somebody's kitchen's fine for them. It sounded like from your characterization, like that futon was rented a, a good number of nights. It was, which is completely shocking to me because I was basically raised on law and order SVU and I would never, but people did it. And I kind of forgot about it, that he had done that. And we moved to Nashville and we bought a rental house. We didn't even really know, like it was called real estate investing. It was just for long-term. It was just like a place to put some money and hopefully get some appreciation and like pay for our future kids college one day. And when, when the check started rolling in from that, we thought, wow, let's do this. Like we want to build a business out of this. So then we started educating ourselves after we spent the, you know, $25,000, $30,000 down payment. Then we started learning how to do it. Right. So we had just a little bit of money left and we said, okay, well, what are we going to do? What can we buy that's going to make the most amount of money, the fastest so that we can then go buy more of these. And we landed on short-term rentals and we'd just been on vacation to the Smoky Mountains, which is a few hours East of Nashville. And we said, okay, well we can do this. That's, this is a place where people go, all the time, all they do is rent cabins. Somebody owns these cabins. Why can't it be us? We didn't want to do it in Nashville because the the regulations are crazy there. And then we thought, well, let's look at who's going to manage this for us. We looked at property management and it was like 40% of your gross income. And we thought, well, that's not going to work. Well, Ian was renting his futon while he was off on tour in Europe. We can certainly manage this thing from Nashville. And so we figured out how to do that. That one worked out really, really well. We scaled from one to five over the course of about 18 months. And I mean, five years later, we have 189 doors. Only nine of them are short terms, by the way. But because the short terms made so much money and make so much money, they cash flow so heavy, yeah. we were able to do exactly what we set out to do, which was scale a portfolio as quickly as possible without over leveraging ourselves, of course. And um, we were able to do that much more quickly because of our short term rentals than if we'd done traditional long term up front. Avery, you said 50 things there that I want to dive into because <laughs> so many of us know so little about this. But even before we get to that, 
I want to ask you about something else that's important because there's a lot of people out there that hate their jobs. When you move from New York City with your boyfriend, now husband, to Nashville, he mm-hmm. was able to kind of transfer in the job that he does there pretty easily. But for you, you were going back to get your master's. And that ended up for you. And I think this was a pretty powerful thing. It seemed like you'd done the math and you thought by getting a master's, that would make more money. But that ended up being a dead end for you. It was absolutely. And it maybe if I'd stayed in it longer, it might have made some more money. But yeah, I said, okay, I've been playing music and bartending for a long time. And it's really difficult to trans to transfer into like the corporate world from bartending. Uh, it's kind of like a stigma almost. So I thought, well, yeah. I'll go get my master's and that'll help me. That'll help me transition. And so I did. And then I had three corporate jobs in three years, got nearly fired from all three. I got put on a performance improvement plan for those of you HR directors out there who know what that is, <laughs> uh, which basically means they're giving you 30 days to quote improve. But really what they're telling you is like, hey, this is your notice. We're going to fire you in 30 days. I'm laughing, by the way, because it's not funny, by the way, it totally isn't funny. And (laughs) and as you know, you're scared to death when that happens because you can see Mm -hmm. the writing on the wall, but I'm laughing because of the fact that it's just such a nightmare. You have to laugh so you don't cry. Yeah, it was terrible. I was up all night, every night. I'm like, oh my God, I thought I was this like decently smart person. And I'm so stupid. I can't even like get, do this $40,000 job without getting fired. It's like bad for your confidence. And so uh, we already had one investment at that point. And I had been working on my real estate license because my husband is a terrible client. He's a New Yorker. Like his negotiation <laughs> skills are like, I'm going to slam your face into this door handle. And so I was, <laughs> I'm like super Southern and overly apologetic about it. I was going to say, so that, does, like, oh that, that does not work in the South. That does not no, work in Mississippi <laughs> at all. It does not fly. Yeah. No. So I was getting my license because I was embarrassed of his behavior and having to like <laughs> apologize to all of our real estate agents. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get this license and I'll do our deals. But my job was kind of falling apart at the same time that this was happening. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just go into real estate. Cause I had friends who were saying, oh, you're making how much on that cabin in the Smokies? Help me get one, show me how to do it. So I'd sell mm. them the cabin, show them how to run it and move on. And then Turns out that was a niche in real estate that needed to be filled. That was a hole in the market. So I just kind of became the short-term rental agent. And now we've got market, we've got offices in 11 markets where we sell people short-term rentals and teach them how to manage it so that they can also quit their jobs. How long did it take you? Did you have enough money coming in that you didn't have to swim a moat? Like, you know, I mean, there, there, for a lot of people, there's a period where the dream of working for yourself is great, but it's not paying the bills like you want it to at first. How long did it take you to swim that motor? Were you able to successfully transition right away? And, and you're making enough money from the legwork you've done ahead of time to be able to afford your lifestyle. Here's the thing. There are a lot of people who sell Airbnb investor courses and have YouTube channels and stuff out there that they're like, buy two, two rentals and quit your job. Buy two, like I was a lot of them's agent. I taught a lot of them how to do it. I was able to quit my corporate job after two, but here's the difference between me and a lot of people. I was making $37,000 a year. That's nothing. That's pennies. So two short-term rentals will cover that. But my advice to other people would be to stay in your job as long as you can. So you can max out your, um, conventional loans and your DTI, because there is no type of financing that is going to be easier to get with better terms Mm. than conventional loans. So keep that income as long as you can. Don't, you know, watch a freaking YouTube channel and then run off and quit your job when you've owned two Airbnbs for less than six months and you haven't even owned anything during a slow season. I didn't, keep your job and maximize it. I didn't even think about that, that the banker's not going to like that at all. Hey, what income stream do you have? Uh, none. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I totally hadn't thought about that. But I want to go back to that first rental property that you have, because this theme that I like, Avery, is that you don't have to be perfect at first. And I think all of us, people that you coach and people that listen to this show, you know, you get nervous that you're going to mess stuff up. But but you you write about how, man, you messed up a lot of stuff on that first property. You actually you bought a house with a little bit of land but your realtor kept talking to you about this kind of Tony, this really nice neighborhood that uh, mm-hmm. chic neighborhood. And you ended up, your first property was just outside of that. If I remember the story correctly, what did you screw mm-hmm. up on that house? How did you get that first rental property completely wrong? Well, uh, 
We were about maybe four and a half cocktails in when we signed those closing <laughs> docs. So, I mean, the, the offer docs, so maybe don't do that. Don't be um, drunk but- when you, don't be drunk when you <laughs> sign your closing document. Yeah, but Some good that advice. particular property, yeah. So we didn't do, the only thing we did wrong on that property was that we didn't know what we were doing, but it ended up being a learning experience because we shot first and asked questions later. If we had known what we were doing, if we had done all these analysis and like listened to all the podcasts and read all the books, we might not have just jumped. So it ended up being the right thing that we jumped and figured it out later because that property did end up being a really good property for just a little single family long-term. The uh, mortgage on it was 650 bucks a month and we were renting it out for 1500 a month. So that's really good for a little long-term. So I would say do not drink and sign offers, but uh, (laughs) that, that one ended up being really good for us. All right. And then, like you said, you went to the Smoky Mountains and that's a beautiful area, Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, that spot. And you're right. Everybody stays in these beautiful rental cabins. Is that where people should look for short-term rentals in these places like Destin, like the Smoky Mountains, these vacation areas where you know there's going to be a lot of traffic? I will preface this with this is just the way that I've done it. There are people who are successful doing it other ways. But for me, I will only buy a short-term rental in a regional drivable vacation destination. So an area that gets a lot of tourism like the Smoky Mountains or Destin and All of that tourism is driving in. I don't like markets where that you have to fly to because in a downturn, when people don't have a lot of money, those are the first to go away. And then in a global pandemic, when people don't want to be cooped up in a flight together, those are also the first to go away. But people will, even if they don't have a lot of extra money right now, or if they don't want to get sick, they will stay in control of their own environment and drive their own car to a place that's, you know, five to 10 hours away from their house. So those markets are the most recession resistant, and they also have typically the most favorable regulations because places like Destin or the Smokies, there's not a lot of hotels. Really, the only accommodations are short-term rentals. So the cities and counties figured out how to regulate that and make money off of it decades ago. You you found that a lot of the real estate people that you called couldn't answer your more technical questions because by this point, you'd figured out some of the formulas, you'd read some And then also they kept pointing you to this regional management company that you said was just going to charge you an arm and a leg. How do you find the right real estate people? You went and got your own real estate license. Is that what you'd advise people to do if they get serious about this? Go get your real estate license yourself? Not necessarily because in order, especially now, the way the market is now, you need an agent who is plugged in and who's done a lot of deals because they have a lot of contacts to help you dig up. There's no inventory right now. So an agent that's really plugged in with all the other agents in the market and then also has a lot of past clients where they can dig up deals for you is really helpful. When I got my license, it was a very different time. There were no no agents that really own properties. There's a lot more of them now. And uh, there were there just weren't really any agents who could even answer simple questions like, Hey, how much do you think this will, like, how much do you think this will make a year? I could read your frustration when you were writing that. (laughs) It was frustrating. And um, the big local property management companies in any market back then, now they've had to lower their prices to keep up with self-managers. But uh, it was 40% of your gross Holy moly. Oh. And now, yeah, yeah. And now it's about 25 is the average. But to give you just an example of what that actually looks like. So I had eight short-term rentals last year. Two of them were only online for about six months. If I'd paid somebody 25% of my gross, I would have paid somebody $200,000 to manage my properties. Yeah. Yeah, And and, and there goes anything you could have made. Like it's, it's, it's all gone bye-bye. Uh, at the end of the introduction, you lay out your system and obviously we don't have time to get into your entire system, But I do want to ask about the seven steps that you have and list them off so that people get an understanding of really some of the legwork that you have to do. And if you don't mind, just a couple sentences on each of these, Avery, about the mistake you see people make, a big mistake that we can help people avoid today. Number one, you say choosing your market. Where do people get that wrong? They choose a market that has bad regulations like Nashville, for example. I always pick on Nashville. Sorry, Nashville folks, but I used to live there and people would come to me and say, hey, I found this awesome million dollar property. It'll make a great Airbnb. Let's buy it. And I'd have to say, "Um, did you check the regulations? You can't short term rent this. So choosing Mm. the wrong market with bad regulations. 
Number two, then on your list is choosing your property. Where do we mess that up? You want to choose a property based on what makes the most sense on what meets the most expectations for the most tourists coming in. So where I see people make a mistake is buying a property for themselves personally that might not be appealing to oh. the mass tourism coming in. Oh, that's great advice. Number three, setting up your listings. I bet this is an important one where people screw it up constantly. Okay. This one really like hurts my brain to have to say, because I <laughs> preach this to every single one of my clients and I still see them do it. Get professional photos. Do not think that your iPhone is good enough because it's not good enough. You need a pro pro photos. The photos are the first things that people see when they're scrolling through and you're not going to get clicked on if it's just like a weird iPhone photo that was taken at night. And like, you can see the light fixture. It's like a weird sun yep. in there. It's yeah. Pro photos. 100%. I will tell you, when we moved from Detroit, uh, case in point of exactly what you're talking about when we bought our house versus when we sold it. We ended up there far shorter than we thought. We were only there two years. And so we didn't make hardly any of the improvements we wanted. Really, we made almost no improvement. But we worked with a phenomenal real estate person because I've always believed that that is a hugely important thing to be surrounded by the right professionals. And Brian, our guy, Avery, <laughs> took such good pictures that we got hella more money for our house without doing nearly anything to it just because the pictures were brighter. They were happier. We didn't have clutter. Like the clutter I see in people's pictures drives me crazy. And so n nobody was looking at the house when we bought it. When, when, when we sold it, we had six people look at the first day and four offers and we had done next to nothing. So I love the picture thing. That is just, you can't state that heavily enough for me. All right. Number four, uh, setting up your systems. I guess probably we don't have a system might be where we get that wrong. Okay. So the biggest mistake I make there, there's a lot of mistakes to make with, with systems, uh, but people who do not use a dynamic pricing tool and just try to manually price their entire year, you're leaving money on the table. And also mm. don't use the Airbnb pricing tool that's set to get you the lowest price. You want to use an, an external pricing tool like Price Labs. Our income went up 20% just when we switched over from manual pricing to using Price Labs. Is Price Labs the name of that badass app that Wendy May showed me in uh, San Diego a few days ago? She told me that you told her or led her to this fantastic app and she was flipping through it. And this thing was amazing. Probably. So what it does is it you know, whatever algorithm is in there, I'm not going to pretend to be some sort of engineer, yeah. but it's constantly analyzing past and present booking data in the market that you're buying based on property size, events that are happening. So there might be an event happening that you don't even know about is happening that you could jack your prices up much higher and get a much higher yep. price per night. And it will, it does all that for you. So you're not having to keep up with it. So it's a pretty amazing tool. Which you should be just to, just to be competitive. You know, you're not ripping people off. You're just being competitive. You're leaving money on the mm -hmm. table if you don't do that. Uh, number five is launching. Where do we mess it up? The biggest mistake that I see is people trying to launch too soon after closing. So I've seen people that will have a booking starting the day of closing. Oh, man. And yeah, that's dumb because all kinds of things can happen with lenders and title companies and we need to push closing back for whatever reason, or you don't actually get possession of the house until the loan funds, which can be the next day. Or sometimes if it's on a Friday, we'll be on Monday and you don't actually have possession of the house and you have to call your, your guests and say, Hey, I actually don't own this yet. Give yourself a buffer between your close date and your launch date, do not try to, to butt those two right up against each other because that is playing with fire. Well, and you, you emphasize over and over that the key to this game too is getting great reviews. And I can, and if you start off that way, Avery, you're, you're, you're asking for a horrible review is your first review. Yeah. It's getting off on the wrong foot. <laughs> yeah. Number six, rolling with the punches. We can obviously say that not rolling with the punches is it, but where do we end up right. taking punches that we don't expect? Micromanaging your guests. Oh. Yeah. Uh, watching your cameras too closely. Like, yeah, you want to have a ring doorbell camera just in case something happens, but you don't want to be monitoring that all day. Your doorbell camera is for if, and if something happens for you to go back and look, it's not for you to spy on people all day. Oh, that's creepy. That makes me not want to stay in there. <laughs> I got cameras all over and number seven, and this is powerful scaling. And I feel like the problem there might be that we don't do it. We don't think in terms of scale, Avery. 
Yeah. A lot of people will say, oh, look at me. I bought these four short term rentals and now I quit my job and now I'm financially free. And I see a lot of people who are like my age and younger. I'm 33 uh, that will do that. And I'm like, you know, you guys don't even have kids yet. You don't know the expense that is coming (laughs) if you decide to have kids. So like quitting your job too early and not scaling. Uh, And then a lot of people think that short-term rentals are the right and only way, and they're not. Uh, Multifamily is a very tried and true investing strategy as well as single family long-terms. And it's not wrong to only buy short-term rentals, but I prefer to use short-term rentals. And I think the right way is to just use them as a cash flow turbocharger to build a portfolio that is diverse, that has all types of real estate, in it uh, and not just focusing on the short terms. You're 33 years old. Tell me how many properties you own short term and long term properties. 189. 189 at 33 years old. (laughs) That is amazing. And that's all building your team. The book is short term rental, long term wealth, your guide to analyzing, buying and managing vacation properties. I'm assuming available on Amazon, but available everywhere, available other places. Everywhere you can buy books, uh, Bigger Pockets Bookstore. Uh, it's a little yeah. bit cheaper there if you buy direct from them. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Audible. It's such a great ecosystem. Do you read the Audible yourself? No, thank God. <laughs> 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 no, they hired a professional voice actor for that. Yeah, that is that is crazy. Uh, I had fun <laughs> reading my book, but I can see how it wouldn't be fun saying the same phrase seventeen times. <sighs> See, I get so, I hate to hear my own voice, which I know is crazy since I have a podcast too, but like I would just obsess over, oh my God, am I saying my S is weird? Did I say, I I just, I could not get through it. It would not be possible. It would just be too anxiety inducing. (laughs) Speaking of your podcast, Avery, we can't let you off the hook without uh, hearing a little bit of the podcast because I've enjoyed it. This is an interesting interview you just did with uh, John Goldstein, I think is his name. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or Josh Goldstein. Yes. And uh, you and Josh have a fantastic conversation. I'd like everybody to hear just a little bit of your podcast. You ask him about Big Bear. He is in another place where there's a lot of traffic and a lot of people that drive to Big Bear. There are a lot of regulations there. And you ask about whether there's got to be people that are within 30 minutes because a lot of communities now have these regulations where somebody has to be close by and also local cleaners, things like that. You ask him, are there companies that do it in Big Bear? Did he have to go find somebody? Let's hear what he has to say. There are a lot of cleaners that do it, but because it's such a big thing in Big Bear, there are a lot of companies that just do 24-7 compliance. Because another thing that you have to do is they'll offer to go and check the people in to make sure that there's the number of people that they said when they booked it, that there's not more. And as long as they do that, if later they add more people there in violation of the city code and that that compliance officer will go down and kick people out basically. Boy, and I never thought about that, Avery. And I thought that was a wonderful part of this, of your show that you really got to pay attention to the local compliance. And I got to imagine that's going to be different everywhere. Yeah, it is going to be different everywhere. So whenever you're choosing a market, you definitely want to make sure that you're calling the city or calling the county if it's not in the city limits and seeing exactly what the rules are. Well, Avery, thanks so much for helping us with short-term rentals today. Uh, Your website, if people want to just learn more before they dive into the book? It's theshorttermshop.com. And the short-term shop, the short-term show, also have the book. We'll have all the links at stackingbenjamins.com on our show notes page. Thanks for hanging out with us. It was great meeting you, finally, after I've heard so much about how awesome it is when people work with you. So thanks a ton. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm David Stein. When I'm not talking to other people about money on Money for the Rest of Us, I'm stacking Benjamins. Big thanks to Avery for hanging out with us. And OG, I love the fact that not only does she do short-term rentals, but also long-term rentals. Again, showing that diversification might be the key to success. I was, uh, we had a rental property. We just sold it, as a matter of fact. That was a question that we had asked the basement many, 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 many months ago and uh, got a good offer and we closed on it a couple weeks ago. Hey, but, um, nice. But one of the tenants leased it from me and then turned it into an Airbnb, which I was super ticked off about. And then realized I didn't really care as long as they paid their rent. You know, they weren't doing anything illegal. Yeah. You know, so yeah. they, they were on time rent payers, which is fine. But I did find it interesting that the people who are buying the or who bought the building, their plan is to turn the whole building into Airbnb. The whole thing. The whole thing. 
With the argument being for less than one third of the month of occupancy, they make the same money. Mm. You know, so you get one third the less wear and tear and, you know, that sort of thing. So interesting idea. It is. But, you know, Avery talked about only only going to areas that people are going to drive to for vacation areas. And the right. area where your where your property is, isn't a huge vacation area. Property was because now I got a boatload of cash. <laughs> yes. Yes. Where your Scrooge property McDuck was. In, it in the yes. in the basement. Yes. <laughs> Turning it all to nickels. Parlay this into some more arbitrage i'm just saying all those people all those these people that bought it not really following avery's advice there so i do like the idea no, I, though I, I understand it but you would be surprised at how popular bay city michigan is you're right i would be surprised <laughs> it is for all the vacation crowd isn't isn't bay city michigan like more bars per capita than any other city of michigan i think i heard that i'm not stat. sure about that yes but um you know, it, it does get a surprisingly high amount of visitors at different times. Like the fireworks are pretty much the best in the country, you know, that I've ever seen. And um, Doug saying no. NFW, dude. Anybody would like to challenge that, I think they'd see. But, um, you yeah, know, the St. Patrick's Day Parade is a pretty big deal there and stuff like that. So there's a few days people like to come visit Bay City. And all those Bay City roller fans. For people yes. that are in there. Well, when the reunion comes out. A T U R D A Y night. Anybody, anybody under 40 has say, no idea. Absolutely nobody listening to this has ever heard of that group <laughs> or song. But she's like, who the hell is that? What if you wanted to see where Madonna was born? You know. That's Rochester, Michigan. Oh, was she born no, in Bay she City? She was born in Bay City. She spent about eleven minutes there before she moved to Rochester. I know that I, I can point you to the house. Claim to fame. And and it's right down the road from this this rental place <laughs> from the Airbnb. We're, Would you like to see where Madonna was born? We're just handing your new owners marketing material, like, advertising right to it. Good for them. Yes, Avery Carl says, "Hey, vacation spot. OG's going to help you turn it into one. It's fantastic. You should charge for that, my friend." Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, Doug, they put what you value first. You got nothing. I got nothing. The spreadsheet's empty right now, it's man. It's the Bay City Rollers Ultimate Collection. Spending time listening to the Bay City Rollers Ultimate Collection. Yes. That's what I care about most. Absolutely. Isn't it? Not, not that much, Don't you gather man. your kids around the, around the hi-fi as it is? Neighbor Doug, don't have. Don't you crank up the Victrola? No. The 8-track. I just keep clicking that big lever to get to that one song I like on the 8-track. Yes. There it is. And then uh, showing young ones the the miracle of uh, old-time technology. And that's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. You go to stackingbenjamins.com. I'm sure that's exactly why. <laughs> go to stackingbenjamins.com slash havenlife now to get a free quote. If you pause, you can get this done right now, which, oh, gee, how, how many times have we talked about get the life insurance stuff done? A few. We've talked about it a few. Yeah. Simple online, get an instant coverage decision. All policies issued by their parent company, Mass Mutual, more than a hundred and sixty year old insurer. Today we're going to throw out the lifeline. We're not really throwing out the lifeline as much. We're throwing on a party hat today, guys. And we haven't done this before. Kind of changed it up. Amanda in the basement said that she is now officially debt free, except her mortgage. It's good stuff. And we don't do the debt-free scream. Somebody else does that. But we certainly, OG, are not above congratulating people that are stackers and got themselves out of debt. Listen to this. They paid off $140,000 in debt in 28 months. About half the debt consisted of student loans, the other half credit cards and an auto loan. Uh, she says, ironically, I've been a stacker now for about the same amount of time. So there's a big correlation. She hangs out. see the one-to-one -one correlation. Hangs out with... Other like-minded people and gets her act together. And actually, you know, what's funny is I, I was being a little flippant there, but seriously, a good thing, OG, to do when you want to get your house in order is surround yourself with people that are going where you want to go. Like that is a big key. Or the people that have been there. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice job. Congratulations, Amanda. And you know what? We're, we, we normally, you have to call in to get the swag. I think we still got to send her some swag for doing that stackybenjamins.com 
slash voicemail, though, if you want to call in and you've got a question for OG and I. We're not usually bringing the party like we do today with Amanda. Instead, we're answering your questions. We can actually make it a party where we festively answer your question if you want. We could do that. Maybe not bright and early in the morning like it is today. But it's still dark. Not a lot of party going on at zero dark 30. Looks like Doug's partying, though. He's got the hat backward. Rock and roll. Well, you know why? He's got the new Airbnb concept. What could go wrong with that? Exactly. Yeah, you just handed me my new business plan for Bay City. I'm going to be the king of Bay City. Speaking of the king, if you want to be the king or queen with your money and you're looking for better help in your corner. You talk about surrounding yourself. People have been there. OG and his team taking clients head to stacking slash OG. Did you just crown OG the King? Well, if you don't, you've been in yeah. the, you're in the basement with him right now. I am. Yeah, he's, I'm halfway across the U S and I can feel it. If you don't, you got to play to the ego. You're right. You're you right. have to keep that rolling. Stacking slash OG link to him and his team. And you know what? You can dream bigger about your finances, which is always exciting. Amanda doing that. He's not even cracking a smile over that. He's just nodding his head like, yeah, I'm the king. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Just duh. It is. Also, if you want to join me, join OG and coming to the East coast, guess what? Uh, Emily Guy Birkin, Paula Pant also going to join us for the five cities on the East coast coming up in early April. That's Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. And then in the Midwest, Doug's going to join us on some of those mm-hmm. uh, stops. I, I might I might even consider Boston. Excellent. If you'll have me. Doug, might even consider. Paula, Emily, and then me. <laughs> People were doing great till they got to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, wow. Joe's going to be there too? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll take all those other ones. You had me and you lost me. <laughs> yeah, but not that guy. But uh, tonight, tonight it's OG and I in Atlanta. Julian Saunders from Rich and Regular. They got a new book coming out soon. Uh, it's going to be our MC, which is awesome. All right. Rich and Regular, do they eat a lot of fiber? I don't understand. You know what's, you know what's funny? I, I absolutely love what Julian and Kirsten do and that, that Rich and Regular name. But every time makes me think about fiber. <laughs> Is that just an old guy problem? I don't. That is, that is, must be between you two guys. <laughs> so on that note, I'm out of here. Yes. Hey, uh, what should we have learned today, Doug? Well, Joe, I'll tell everybody what they should have learned today. First, the homestay business has exploded and provides a new income stream to many stackers out there. Avery Carl just made it easier for you to compete in that market. Second, worried about scams? Well, as OG said, there are some that are going to find you no matter what you do. But if a guy asks you to meet him in a parking lot to complete a significant financial transaction, that might be a clue that the bad guys are at work in Gotham City. But the big lesson? Sergeant Simpson from the Texarkana Police Department says the name Brothel might not be the best for a B&B. He insists it sounds a lot like something, but I'm not going to share it here on the air, but it sounds like that other place is serving a little more than soup, if you know what I mean. Thanks to Avery Carl for joining us today. Her book, Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth, Your Guide to Analyzing, Buying, and Managing Vacation Properties is available in the bookstore nearest your next homestead. Did I just say nearest? Wherefore? Art thou. Art thou. Heretofore. Your next homestead. This show is the property of SB Podcasts, LLC, copyright 2022, and is created by Joe Salcihai. Our producer is Karen Repine. The show is written by the brilliant Paulette Perhatch, with help from Joe, me, and Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast. After you listen to our show, check out the 201 Deep Dives, written by our website manager and blog editor, Brooke Miller. You'll find the 411 on all things money at the 201. Just go to stackingbenjamins.com slash 201. Once we bottle up all this goodness, we ship it to our engineer, the amazing Steve Stewart. Steve helps the rest of our team sound nearly as good as I do right now. Want to chat with friends about the show later? Mom's friend Gertrude is our social media coordinator and the room mother in our Facebook group called The Basement. 
So, say hello when you see us posting online. Here's a weird fact. Both she and Tina Eichenberg are never in the same room at the same time. To join all the basement fun with other stackers, type stackingbenjamins.com slash basement. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we'll see you next time back here at the Stacking Benjamin Show. Not only should you not take advice from these dorks, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any financial decisions, speak with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. OG has already taken off. <laughs> has seriously already taken off. There he is. He's he's coming back. I went to uh, Disney World on my day off. I was really looking forward to that. But I just got to tell you two stories. One was, again, how much these employees at Disney, just, just how great they are and how plugged in they are. I'm park hopping. I'm going from Hollywood Studios over to Epcot. I pull in at the Epcot parking lot and I hand the receipt to this woman who's going to look at it and make sure I already paid for parking so they don't have to pay twice. And she said, how was your time at the other park? And I said, oh, it was really good. I had a really fun time. Thanks. And as she hands me back the receipt, she smiles and she goes, well, I hope we treat you even better. And I just, I don't know. I thought that was, maybe she uses that line all day long. It was just very very good. And it seemed like hit, hit you all in the feels. Yeah. Yeah. And it really, I didn't expect that at all. Well, I hope we do even better. I mean, what, a, what an expectation when you go to a business and they're like, Nope, we're going to beat them. We're going to be even better. Even though it's two places, supposedly Did you find anything same. closed. Cause we read that, uh, splash mountain was hit by lightning and they closed like 10 rides at magic kingdom. Wow. Yeah. Uh, no huge thunderstorms, but no, didn't affect you at all. That's good. Didn't have Slinky Dog going during the rain, during a thunderstorm. That would have been bad. I did get to ride the new Rise of the Resistance, though, which is was an amazing ride. Has Joe ever said anything negative about Disney? No, ever. Oh, I can I can say a bunch negative about Disney and Bob Paycheck. I mean Chapek. I'm sorry, I got that wrong. Oops. Yeah, who's that? That's the CEO. Oh, I'm supposed to know that? You know who Bob Iger was? Like, did you yeah, know Bob know Iger, that. Michael Eisner? So, <laughs> yeah, Reddit decided, Doug, because of all the short term crap this dude's done, that his name isn't Bob Chapek, it's Bob Paycheck. I can't believe I'm not right up on top of that. There's some super ugliness. I can't, I can't believe it either. But let me tell you the awkward one, then we'll get out of here. Cause this one was Joe being very awkward. This was uncomfortable. I'm on star tours, which for people that haven't been to Disney is a, like a motion simulator. You sit inside of this thing, like a row of 10 people and there's maybe five rows of 10 people. And I'm in the back row and on my left, the only three people to my left are a teenage girl and her parents. And they're sitting, they're sitting on my left and they are speaking Spanish to each other. And on my right, is another family with teenage age people sitting to my right. And then parents, a family of four. So I got two families next to me and I'm of course at the park, (laughs) middle-aged dude at Disney by himself, which was a ton of fun. However, this wasn't when you buckle yourself in, cause this thing's like a bucking Bronco, you have to buckle up. And then to prove that you're buckled up, there's a yellow strap And they make you pull on the yellow strap to show that you're buckled up. 
And as we get to the last row, the woman who works the ride is trying to tell this Spanish speaking family to pull on the strap, to take their hand and yank on the strap. And they're not getting it. And she keeps re-explaining it like three times. And the people on my right are trying to help out. They're kind of, you know, like if you say it slower, people are going to get it. And the people are saying Spanish. And the woman is so busy trying to get the ride going, she doesn't hear them saying Spanish. So I start making a motion like I'm pulling on the strap. So I take my hand and it's right in my lap and I start moving my hand up and down. And then I look to the right and I see that these two teenagers are cracking up because I'm making an obscene gesture, trying to help the Spanish speakers figure out that they need to pull on the strap. And it was horrifying. It was absolutely horrifying road to hell. It was not good. It was, it was, it was not good gestures. No, you have to pull it like this. You got to do this thing. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not, not great. Get an inside look at Hollywood with Michael Rosenbaum. Let's get inside of Kristen Krug. You would do anything if you love the role. If it was healthy, I would never want to hurt myself for a role. Because there's some roles. There's like that guy in Walking Dead. They say he would. You no, know, he didn't shower a lot. He smelled on set. He wanted to be that kind of character. Could you see yourself doing that? What's the point? Isn't that what makeup's for? <laughs> <laughs> Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 